Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. David Tay. Dr. Tay attended medical school at Chicago Medical School in Illinois. He completed his residency and his internship at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. He did his fellowship at UCLA. Dr. Tay is board certified in internal medicine and nephrology and is also the medical director for the Washington Dialysis Service. Thank you folks for coming and uh, welcome to our seminar today. It's uh, see, uh, nice to see some familiar faces here in the audience. Um, today we'd like to talk about chronic kidney disease, um, which is a uh, disease that oftentimes causes a lot of fear and worry in those who've been diagnosed to have that. Many here could remember the time that your doctor tell, told you that uh, you have kidney problems and, or a loved one, that uh, how you felt about it and how everything seemed to stop at that moment. Or you're here because you've heard of others who've had it and you want to avoid it. Today, let's discuss what chronic kidney disease is all about, what are the common causes, and what you can do to help your doctor diagnose it early, and uh, what you and your doctor can do about it. We used to use the term called uh, chronic renal failure for varying degrees of kidney disease, and thankfully we don't use that anymore because it sounds so terminal and uh, very severe. Uh, let's look at the uh, statistics here. Um, in 1973, when Medicare um, Medicare-funded end-stage renal disease program started. They had 10,000 enrollees. That is 10,000 uh, patients who needed dialysis. In 1983, the numbers grew. It grew to uh, 48,000. In 2008, the ranks have grown further to 527,000 people on dialysis. Of course, this is due to population growth. It's changing demographics in the United States. And there's under-recognition of early kidney disease and there are uh, increasing risk factors for chronic kidney disease. It's an expensive uh, disease. Medicare uh, estimates the cost per hemodialysis patient is about 77,000 a year. Transplant patients are not as expensive, but they still cost a lot of money to care. They uh, cost about $26,000 per year. Today, about 26 million uh, Americans have chronic kidney disease and about 87,000 of Americans die of uh, causes related to kidney failure. We mentioned that we have a, a slightly more than half a million of uh, uh, dialysis patients in the United States and uh, about 150,000 patients who have received kidney uh, transplants. The um, chronic kidney disease is, uh, does not hit all the um, um, various races and ethnicities uh, equally. In Caucasians, you see about 268 uh, cases per million, and uh, it hits the African Americans uh, much more disproportionately, about 990, about 1,000 per million. And uh, the um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders also are affected uh, uh, heavy, heavily, as are the Native Americans and Alaska Natives. And the rate in the Hispanic population is also higher than the non-Hispanic Caucasians. Also, in the South Asian population, we see that an increased risk as well. This is from studies in the United Kingdom. Uh, interestingly, um, one out of five uh, Pima Indians in uh, Arizona are diabetics, and very high rates of them have de uh, developed kidney failure. So what do your kidneys do? The kidney, along with the liver, are the uh, major organs that remove body waste. It removes uh, excess fluid and byproducts of metabolism. For instance, why is urine yellow? That's because of the discoloration, the color in the urine called bilirubin. 
It's a product of uh, metabolism of red cells. It's no longer red, it turns uh, yellow, and that's why stool and uh, urine is yellow in, in appearance. It also keeps body fluids in, it, in balance. Um, patients with um, kidney disease tend to have uh, swelling in the legs, tend to have more frequent episodes of heart failure, tend to be more hypertensive. It also regulates the blood electrolytes. Uh, kidneys are mas master um, chemists of the body. Uh, you've heard of um, high potassium pay, uh, problems in patients with kidney disease. And uh, a lot of people uh, with kidney problems uh, have calcium issues as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The kidneys also remove foreign substances, drugs, toxins. And um, while not all uh, drugs are exc excreted in the urine, um, a um, good um, portion of it is. It also produces hormones. It regulates blood cell production. It produces, it uh, helps uh, metabolism of bone, keeping your bones healthy. Let's look at the kidney anatomy here. The um, kidneys are, as all you all know, are located below the diaphragm on both sides, just behind the stomach and behind the, uh, underneath the liver and it's getting its blood supply from the aorta. And when you look at the kidney, uh, when you section it in half, uh, there are um, these uh, structures called the medulla, and uh, in it are thousands of uh, filtering units called the nephron. This is the, um, um, di a diagram of it. It's con uh, composed of a filtering unit called the glomerulus, and uh, and where the urine is produced and then it's passed into the uh, tubule system where the urine is refined further and then drained into the collecting system where it drains into the, um, into the pelvis and then goes out into the bladder. Let's look at the most common causes of kidney disease. Diabetes is a very uh, uh, common cause of uh, kidney problems. You can see about 43% uh, of kidney diseases in the United States is caused by diabetes. It's slightly more in the West Coast for some reason, maybe because of our different population. This is a diagram, uh, this is a picture of a normal glomerulus in a, uh, a normal patient. You see it has a normal lacy pattern, and uh, you see these are the tubules um, where the urine is purified further and see how the, um, uh, the urinary space is um, uh, encircled by the capsule, which is continuous. And this is the capillary that provides blood to the glomerulus. This is the glomerulus in, diabet in a diabetic patient. You notice there's a lot of um, uh, infiltrates into the, uh, uh, into the filter here, a lot of foreign protein. And um, uh, notice also how there's a bit of an enlargement of the glomerulus itself. Uh, risk factors for this condition is uh, mainly um, poor blood sugar control and blood, poor blood pressure control. Um, and those who are smokers, it also accelerates the disease process. And there's also controversy whether women who have used oral contraceptives are more likely to have this disease than diabetics who don't. There are also other risk factors that are non-modifiable. African Americans tend to have more of this condition. Hispanics and the American natives. Of course, uh, the older you are, the more likely you are to have this condition. And the duration of diabetes. The longer you're diabetic, the more likely you, have, you are to have this uh, problem as well. Let's look at hypertension. One out of four patients in the United States with uh, kidney disease have it mainly on the basis of hypertension. This is the uh, normal glomerulus we talked about before. And this is the uh, kidney biopsy from a hypertensive patient. You notice how there's, uh, just like in the diabetic, there's a lot more infiltrates in the uh, filters. Even one such uh, glomerulus is completely uh, scarred. You don't see much of a blood circulation or even the urinary space is completely obliterated. The arteries are also thickened. And uh, what's most striking to me uh, on this uh, 
um, sample is that uh, there is a lot of scarring in the tissues. You see a lot of this pink material in between compared to the normal tissue where there isn't much. This is all from the high blood pressure, damage of the um, uh, tissues, damage of the filters. This is most often seen pa in patients with long history of hypertension, especially poorly controlled hypertension. And uh, you can also see it uh, in people with eye disease from diabetes, the so-called retinopathy, and um, in those whose high blood pressures have been uh, severe enough to cause uh, enlargement of their heart, the, what we call the left ventricular hypertrophy. Again, risk factors of the disease is the uh, black race, severe hypertension, and also underlying chronic diseases tend to accelerate this disease as well. This is a study to show um, how blood pressure affects your uh, uh, kidney health. Um, this is a study back in 1996 um, in the uh, uh, John Hopkins uh, University. People with optimal blood pressure, that is blood pressures around 120 over 80, tend to have very little progression of their kidney disease. There's still some, but very little. This is over a, a period of uh, 16, 17 years. And um, the risk worsens with worsening blood pressure control. Stage four hypertension is defined those with a blood, uh, for those with blood pressures over 210, over 120. See how much uh, steeper the curve is and what, how much more likely they are to develop kidney failure. If you think 3% is not much, just consider how many patients are actually in the United States with hypertension. It's a very common disease. Let's look at the third more common ca uh, causes of uh, kidney failure, the inflammation, the so-called glomerular lunephritis. Only about seven out of 10 uh, of, of cases, uh, but it's still significant enough. We'll talk about these uh, different kinds. This is uh, so many um, different kinds of kidney disease that it is hard to lump it into one, uh, together, but to um, explore each uh, disease is probably beyond the scope of this um, uh, lecture. Let's use a, um, a um, kidney disease that's relatively common. Um, it's called uh, systemic lupus. And uh, the disease is very aggressive and has many different manifestations. This is a more common, a more uh, severe uh, case of lupus nephritis. You can see how uh, there's so much inflammatory cells in the kidney. And there's a scarring process that's already developing, the so-called crescent. See how the capsule here is already disrupted by the inflammation? There's a, rent, there's a break in it. And it, it, even the glomerulus itself is broken up. You can see there's a, actually a separation. To, uh, there's different kinds of glomerular nephritis. Some are limited to the kidneys, and some are limit, are, are, uh, affects different organ systems of the body, things like lupus, diabetes, or uh, certain infections. Signs of symptoms of glomerular nephritis is quite mild, and uh, oftentimes it's um, um, something you can pick up early. We'll, we'll discuss that in the subsequent slides. Uh, oftentimes you see elevated blood pressure, over 140 or 90. There's fluid retention, or edema, hands, face or feet, or, or abdomen. And uh, some of them may also feel fatigue due to anemia of kidney failure. Some also notice a decrease in urination. The urinary abnormalities may not be obvious. Some may dismiss it as not drinking enough water. Some may dismiss it as monthly menstrual cycle when they see bloody urine. And uh, some may dismiss it as intake of certain foods. Now, there are some heredit hereditary conditions uh, that we talk about. It's relatively rare, um, about 2%, uh, 3% of these conditions. Uh, the more common ones, is, uh, a, the more common one is called polycystic kidney disease. There's different forms of it, adult form and uh, childhood form. This is a, uh, a CAT scan of a patient with polycystic kidney disease, and you can see how the kidneys are grossly enlarged, and there are multiple cysts within the kidneys. Now, many of you may have been diagnosed with a cyst in the kidney. Those are called acquired cysts, uh, and uh, unless you have many cysts, such as these, that does not constitute adult polycystic kidney disease. It's just cysts from aging. There's also a uh, rare condition that's uh, transmitted in certain um, families called Allport syndrome, typically of, uh, in those uh, folks from uh, Southern Europe or Mediterranean origin. 
oftentimes associated with hearing loss, oftentimes seen in males. The, um, um, it's sort of relatively rare, but uh, there's probably about one or two families in uh, the surrounding area that have that, and um, it's, um, um, it's interesting how it is passed uh, uh, only to the male members of the uh, family. Now going back to polycystic kidney disease, the adult form is uh, relatively um, common. It's in, seen in one in every 400 to 1,000 people. But only half of the people with this condi uh, condition are diagnosed because most of them are, remain without symptoms for their lives. Usually only one parent has the condition and only half of the children have the disease because it is passed uh, genetically. The childhood form is uh, much uh, more um, rare. It's about one out of 10,000 or 20,000. Usually diagnosed in infancy or childhood. Usually neither parent has the disease, but both have the genetic traits. Now let's talk about the different stages of chronic kidney disease. You probably heard it, that there are different stages. Maybe your physician had mentioned to you what stage you are, whether you're stage two, stage three, or stage four. This is defined by the National Kidney Foundation, and uh, stage one is the mildest kind where you have normal kidney function. Uh, the only abnormalities that uh, the, uh, you may have is the uh, kidney, signs of kidney damage, such as protein in the urine. And it progresses, progresses uh, over the stages, depending on the kidney function. We'll talk about, our, uh, about the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, uh, shortly. Um, all the way to stage five, where there's minimal kidney function, including those who need dialysis. Glomerular filtration rate is uh, the easiest way to determine uh, where a patient is functioning. And it is something that's um, easily obtained in the blood test. And it basically stands for, um, it uh, indicates how much blood do your kidneys filter in a given amount of time. So in this case, of course, the higher the better. Not everybody's born with a uh, um, high GFR. Some of us uh, are born with lower amounts, and that declines naturally with age. So how do you determine your GFR? The simplest method is a blood test. It's an easy and quick estimate, but we should emphasize the word estimate in that. This is a sample of a uh, patient's blood test, and um, usually I'll, this is a, a, a basic metab com comprehensive metabolic panel. It's also the same test is also shown in your uh, basic metabolic panel, more, one of the more common tests that or doctors order. The GFR is what uh, the number that we're looking at. It's uh, usually, in, um, you have to uh, look at your test results and discuss that with your doctor. It's, um, the uh, chemistry panel is one of the more common tests that doctors order in, the test, in your um, um, routine tests, so you can ask for it to see if he would uh, let you know what it is. This is another example. Again, uh, what's important here is that the um, uh, result is reported as estimated GFR. You wonder, why is it called estimated GFR? Because it's inaccurate in the non-average body, uh, body sizes. For instance, in our former governor, that would really underestimate his GFR because it does not take into account um, his muscle mass. On the, other one, uh, on the other hand, in the uh, less endowed constituent of the state, that would be an overestimation of his kidney function. A more accurate test of your kidney function is called creatinine clearance. It's done through a 24-hour urine collection. Some of you have done this test, and uh, you probably remember the uh, uh, urine collection uh, container, and uh, that you have to uh, uh, collect all your urine within a 24-hour period and bring it, uh, bring it to the laboratory. It's um, not as convenient because it uh, involves time. There's a lot of hassle. A lot of people choose to stand at, uh, stay at home so they can collect the urine instead of going out that, on that day. And there's also issues of uh, urine collection errors. Sometimes we forget, sometimes we spill. And on the other hand, this test is more accurate because it's not affected by muscle mass. So how do you detect, how do you detect kidney function uh, abnormalities? Two things. We talked about the chemistry panel that your doctor can do or has done. The other, the other one's a urine analysis. 
as uh, your uh, routine uh, urine testing. Two things we look at in your analysis, mainly is the uh, presence of blood in the urine, what we call hematuria. And, uh, and the other one is the presence of protein in the urine, what we call proteinuria. Hematuria in the urine can present as a um, slightly discolored urine. In the sample, you can see there's an orange reddish tinge to it. And um, the urine may appear uniformly red, but once you spin it down in a centrifuge, it, uh, uh, all of it is then concentrated on the bottom. This is a, a, our way of telling that this, is, this redness is from blood. If it's discoloration in the urine from foods and from uh, uh, medications, it, does not, it will not separate from the urine. Foods like beet, for instance, can turn your urine red. Uh, medications like peridium, what your doctor gives you for urinary tract infection, can turn your urine red. So it's not necessarily blood in the urine. On the other hand, there are some serious causes of, um, serious and not so serious causes of blood in the urine. The most common cause is a menstrual cycle in uh, women. Or a bladder infection, because of all the inflammation in the bladder, you may see blood in the urine. It may discolor it. Kidney infection is more serious, but typically you have the symptoms of it. Flank pain, discomfort, high fevers and chills, and just general illness. Kidney stones is another obvious cause of it. This obvious flank pain that goes to the groin and uh, blood in the urine. Most people with kidney stones have it recurrently. And certain kidney diseases would also uh, show blood in the urine. People who in intensely exercise may have muscle damage to the degree that uh, the muscle uh, um, pigment called myoglobin is released in the circulation and may end up in the urine. That can be a bad um, uh, occurrence also. These people do need hydration very heavily such that it doesn't cause kid uh, further kidney damage by itself. Injury, same thing. Muscle injury typically releases uh, uh, myoglobin into the urine. Cancer, obviously, from bleeding from, um, uh, from organ bleeding. So blood in the urine may or may not be serious. So if you see that, it's best that you discuss it with your doctor, not just dismiss it. It's uh, human nature to dismiss something that's happening to us, thinking that it is not um, serious and uh, never uh, just to have it haunt us later on in life. Now, protein in the urine, proteinuria. Usually you see a lot of bubbles in your urine that um, does not go away after a few minutes. Typically, your first morning urine would show some protein, uh, would show, show a lot of bubbles in the urine, but usually clears up within minutes. But if it persists, that may point out to protein in the urine. It can be temporary or transient. Um, it can be related to fevers or exercise. And in certain young people under the age of 18, it could be related to the upright posture. But usually they grow out of this. But if this protein is persistent all day long and it doesn't go away with rest or with, re or with resolution of fevers, it may point out to a medical problem. How does proteinuria develop? So again, this is the same diagram we looked at before. This is the glomerulus with the uh, uh, capillary tuft in it and the urinary space. And this is where the urine is produced and then passed into the tubules. This is a diagram of such a capillary, typically. Protein is kept within the blood, within the capillary itself. Your uh, blood is rich in protein, but typically nothing leaks because this membrane is very, um, uh, very tight and does not uh, allow it to leave. On the other hand, in conditions where there's kidney disease, protein in the blood is now found in the urine because of the leakage. So usually, uh, protein in the urine indicates a, a leakage, some, uh, some occurrence in the, uh, in the kidney. So it may indicate damage to the kidney filters. And, um, and sometimes, in some cases, it's also overproduction of serum proteins, which is another serious condition, such as in the case of multiple myeloma. There's rare uh, genetic conditions, so you can see proteinuria, but um, Rather than dismissing it as a, um, that rare condition, it's best that you let your doctor decide if that's the case. Now, this is some examples of edema. These are not just fat legs. 
you can see from the shininess of the skin how it's distended. The skin is uh, somewhat taut. And when you press on the tissue for a few seconds, five seconds or more, it tends to leave a depression. That's what they call pitting edema. That tells you that it's an excess tissue water. So be sure that you, uh, when you check for this, you uh, uh, keep pressure for at least a few seconds. So edema is usually a bubble swelling. And um, it's not always a kidney problem, but often uh, it does point to it. Also consider other problems, such as cardiac problems, liver problems. And sometimes medications can make you retain uh, salt and make you swelling, uh, give you swelling. There's also hormonal problems, such as thyroid problems, that can cause edema. Of course, local injuries, varicose veins, blood clots, tend to cause edema as well. But usually this tends to be on just one leg, not on both legs. So if you have it on both, it's usually it's a, a, a medical systemic condition, such as your kidney, your heart, or your liver. Now I've been asked a lot about urinary frequency. Um, what we, uh, a condition that we call nocturia, is waking up from sleep at night to void. And uh, normally people go to the bathroom once or twice at night. When you start getting up more than uh, th um, twice, that's an abnormality. Causes that we have to look at. One is a low volume voids where you can't pass as much uh, urine as you uh, should be. Uh, things like prostatic enlargement, that indicates a an obstruction. Overactive bladder, it makes you go often because your bladder cannot withstand the uh, increased volume. Urine infection can also cause frequency because the bladder is very irritable and uh, wants to uh, uh, empty itself frequently. Now, sleep disorders can also make you get up and use the bathroom just because you're not sleeping as soundly. It's not because of the local problems necessarily. It's just a disturbed sleep. Now, nocturia can also occur from an increased urine output, such as poor control of diabetes, heart failure, kidney disease, or if you take your diuretics late at night. Also, if you drink a lot of fluids, especially late in, at night, that may cause your uh, go the, going to the bathroom frequently. It may be more beneficial to reduce the uh, bother caused by nocturia than to target the uh, reduction. Um, the aim is to really to minimize the negative impact on the quality of life. So a lot of people with, diff um, uh, with difficulty returning to sleep because of urination, they um, need to concentrate on what's causing them to uh, sleep poorly. And uh, um, this can also result in morning fatigue because you're not sleeping well at night. There's also in the elderly as a, as a risk of falls because of uh, frequency of going to the bathroom. So the first thing you want to do is just adjust the uh, timing of your fluid intake. And uh, if you can, eliminate taking your diuretics at night. Take it in the afternoon or in the morning. In some women, pelvic floor exercises would be a good idea. And in some, they may also consider using a urinal or a commode near the bed. So it's not, uh, the nighttime awakenings are not as disturbing. There's also things that can be diagnosed from looking at the eye. Your eye doctor can see a lot of changes in the uh, bottom of your eye, the retina. For instance, in the diabetic, you can see there's a lot of uh, new blood vessels growth. They, they may also see a lot of uh, uh, spot hemorrhages or some exudates in the uh, bottom of the eye, the retina. In the hypertensive, you may see a lot of narrowed vessels such as these, what the so-called copper wiring changes. This tells him that there are some diseased blood vessels in your eyes and typically what happens in your eyes also happens elsewhere and therefore the kidneys. It's a good idea to see your eye doctors regularly, especially if you're hypertensive or diabetic. The treatment uh, for diabetic nephropathy uh, for people with diabetes. The first thing you can do is life our lifestyle changes. Limit the amount of salt you eat. If you smoke, quit smoking. Lose weight if you're overweight, dieting, exercise. There's also um, a controversy about how much protein one should have in kidney disease. This moderate protein restriction is probably a good idea. 
there are studies that show some modest but not significant benefit. And it's usually pretty well tolerated. And if you eat the right amount, it does not lead to malnutrition. Of course, if you avoid it completely, you may get malnourished. So as long as uh, your caloric goals are met and your dietary protein is of high biological value, it's a good idea. Now, your uh, blood sugar also has a lot of impact on uh, kidney disease. Keeping your blood sugars to, um, uh, close to normal can certainly help. It can prevent the long-term complications of diabetes, not just in the kidneys, but also in the eyes and the, uh, in your nerves and your heart. So for most people, the target of the blood sugar should be between 80 to 120. Of course, that varies with, ev with everyone. There's a blood test called the hemoglobin A1C that should be used to monitor blood sugar levels. It reflects your average of blood, uh, blood sugar levels over the past uh, two to three months. An A1C of 7% or less, even 6.5, is recommended. But even small decreases in A1C lowers the risk of diabetic complications. Now, blood pressure management. The benefit is usually greatest if the treatment is started before a great deal of irreversible damage has occurred. But no matter what, what stage you're in, it is always helpful at, uh, in retarding the disease. So in people, this uh, impact is the greatest if it's uh, creatinine is less than 1.2 in women and 1.5 in men, or your, your GFR is uh, um, greater than 60. But as I mentioned, it's always a good idea to keep your blood pressure down. Uh, recommended blood pressures in kidney disease is uh, between 120 to 130 and between 70 to 80 diastolic. Choice of medications and diabetic nephropathy. The um, main ones are ACE inhibitors and uh, the so-called angiotensin receptor blockers, the ARBs. In this diagram, people who are treated with an ACE inhibitor called captopril seems to progress a lot slower than those who are treated with placebo or non-ACE inhibitor antihypertensives. And um, the newer medications, the ARB, also has a similar effect on the diabetics. One uh, caution, though, that uh, women who are pregnant or are attempting to get uh, pregnant should not take ACE inhibitors or ARBs because it can cause birth defects. After you've uh, started treatment and uh, you've made the uh, lifestyle changes we've discussed, um, you will need to repeat your urine and blood tests to make sure that urine and protein levels have improved. Because if things have not improved, your doctor may need to adjust your medications further. Certainly it's a good idea to have a, a close follow-up, so don't rest on your laurels once you start taking these medications or uh, do what you should do. Home blood pressure monitoring is, uh, oh, before we go on, um, let's, uh, let's switch gears here to hypertensive nephropathy. Same thing with the uh, same management as the uh, uh, diabetic. Lifestyle changes, blood pressure management. There are studies also that two, those two medications we talked about, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, help retarding progression in these disease. Home blood pressure monitoring is very important. It's uh, much more predictive of adverse outcomes than clinic blood pressures. So, uh, complications such as stroke or kidney failure is uh, reduced uh, with uh, blood pressure control at home. Home blood pressure measurements gives you a better idea of whether the treatment, whether the doctor's treatment is working. You've all heard of white coat hypertension? Many patients are anxious while visiting the doctor, uh, leading to an office blood pressure readings that's substantially higher than the patient's blood pressure. This is a study that uh, did uh, quite a, way, a ways back. Um, blood pressure is checked by an unfamiliar doctor tends to be much higher in about 30, uh, 30 hypertensive uh, subjects. And uh, it gets better uh, with a bit more time, but it never really disappears. You see the same effect when an unfamiliar nurse does that. So this is a real condition that uh, uh, can be seen. It's a good idea that uh, the, um, the doctor takes that into account because um, if he does not take white coat hypertension into account, it may lead to overtreatment of blood pressure. 
So you may have more side effects on the medications, dizziness, high potassium levels. On the other hand, if the doctor believes the patient has uh, white coat hypertension, it may lead to therapeutic inertia where he does not treat your high blood pressure. So it's always a good idea to have your blood pressure re um, recorded at home and show it to your doctor. Give us a better idea of what's, uh, what you're doing at home. A lot of uh, blood pressure monitoring kits are available now. You can buy it all over Costco, Walmart, Target, and uh, uh, they're quite easy to use. It doesn't, uh, uh, the new ones don't require a stethoscope to, hear, to uh, uh, detect your blood pressure readings anymore, and uh, there are models that records it for you. But if you have a model that does not record it, please uh, write down your readings and bring that to your doctor. Let's talk about glomerulonephritis. Um, a, a rarer kind uh, of kidney disease. Because there are so many different kinds, it, uh, the treatment really depends on the type, cause, and severity. And uh, it also depends on the form, whether it's acute or chronic. It depends on the underlying cause. And it also depends on the associated uh, signs of uh, symptoms. Without getting too technical here, it's um, uh, conditions that are infection-related tends to get better after the infection itself is treated. But other types may require treatment uh, with uh, aggressive medications or treatments. Those who are immunomediated, for instance, or presumed immunomediated may need immunosuppression medications such as steroids, glucocorticoids. And then there are aggressive, more aggressive ones that are rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis that re require treatment with plasmapheresis. And then there are those who need uh, cancer type of drugs to suppress the immune system. Now, not all glomerular diseases require treatment. Some do not respond to any treatment. Some get better on their own. So it all depends. And uh, the problem with this disease is it's difficult to determine what's going on just looking at the patient exter externally. If you remember those slides I showed you of, uh, of uh, kidney tissue, those are microscopic specimens. And it is impossible to see that without obtaining a kidney biopsy, a piece of the, the tissue itself. All, what we ha all the modalities that we have, ultrasounds, CAT scans, and MRIs, just do not have the necessary resolution to see those cells. Now, polycystic kidney disease, as we mentioned, that one of the hereditary diseases is a, um, a disease that's very frustrating to treat because it is genetic and it's oftentimes um, um, irreversible. On the other hand, um, only, as I mentioned, only half of those patients should have uh, symptoms in their lifetime. The treatment is still the same. High blood pressure management, dietary protein restriction, and screening. On the other hand, uh, screening is not usually recommend during, recommended during childhood unless the child has signs of symptoms. Diagnosis during childhood does not change the medical treatment because they don't have any uh, active uh, disease. It can only potentially cause the, the, the child to worry. In the adult, being diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease, disease can potentially affect the person's ability to obtain life insurance while not really altering the course. You don't have much of a um, treatment for this condition. Now what happens when the kidneys uh, completely fail when you reach chronic kidney disease stage five. The treatment is called renal replacement therapy. There's th uh, mainly three different types, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and renal transplantation. Hemodialysis is a treatment where um, a patient goes to a center and where two needles are inserted into a specially constructed um, dialysis fistula, uh, a vein that's uh, put in uh, for such a treatment. One needle draws blood into the machine the machine filters it and replaces the necessary electrolytes and removes the bad ones and returns it back to the patient. This is done several times a week, typically three times a week. The patient typically lives at home and uh, uh, he stays in the uh, unit about three hours or four hours, sometimes more depending on body size. Peritoneal dialysis is a treatment that you uh, do at home. It's a uh, treatment where a special fluid is passed into the uh, body cavity called the peritoneal cavity. And it sits there for a few minutes where it exchanges um, electrolytes. It absorbs the toxins from the bloodstream. 
and then it's uh, allowed to drain into a bag and then discard it and then fresh fluid is then instilled back into the patient. This is your peritoneum membrane which is the uh, inside lining of your abdominal cavity and there's potential space in there. It's not usually not filled with air or anything or fluid. It's usually dry but this is where we put the fluid uh, for dialysis. And the patients do this at home seven days a week and uh, in between exchanges they can do things on their own. They can work they can live a normal life. There's also machines that will do this automatically at home while you sleep, the so-called cycle or assisted peritoneal dialysis. Kidney transplantation is, uh, gives you the best outcome of uh, all renal replacement therapies. The kidney uh, from a healthy donor is uh, basically it's transplanted into the pelvis, into the false pelvis here. Uh, you notice the patient's own native kidneys, diseased kidneys, are not removed unless there's a problem such as bleeding or infections or uh, uh, they're just way too large, such as in the case of polycystic kidney disease. The reason you don't uh, place the transplant kidney in the uh, original uh, spot is because placing it here in the pelvis makes it for a much uh, simpler surgery. The connections are all there, connections to an artery, connections to a vein, and connection to the bladder and also makes the incision, the uh, surgical wound, much smaller than it would have been if it was, were to be implanted in the original space. So um, recipients tend to have three kidneys even though these two usually do not work and um, uh, they depend on one function. Before we go that far, the problem with kidney transplantation, even though the results are much better than the rest, there's always a problem of shortage of organs. Uh, there's a typical, uh, typically long waiting list for kidney transplants between five to seven years. And um, there's always a shortage of people willing to donate. Even those who are um, alive now um, are not, uh, have never thought about their own mortality and are not going around exactly uh, volunteering kidney uh, uh, donation. So there's always a waiting list even though this, this gives you the best result. So, in summary, kidney disease is, is, uh, tends to be a solid disease. It's, it varies from mild to malignant, and it can be uh, managed with a good medical attention. However, it is the only more major organ failure whose failure can be compensated with machinery or surgery. Not many other major organs can um, be treated as such. Okay, I'd like to entertain uh, questions from the uh, audience. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, my question is, um, I had never heard of this purine, I'm just gonna say it wrong, the second type of dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis? Yes, mm -hmm. so um, for an IgA patient, would that be something that could be used when it comes to that point? Certainly, there's uh, no problems at all in an IgA patient to be uh, on the peritoneal dialysis. In fact, a lot of people on peritoneal dialysis report a better quality of life than hemodialysis patients because it, it, for, it for them, affords them more mobility, more independence, and the diet is a lot less restricted than those who are on hemodialysis. Because when you think about it, there is a um, certain uh, um, uh, this dialysis that occurs on a daily basis that whatever you eat is clean on a daily basis. It's not as efficient as the hemodialysis. It's not as a, um, um, it does not work as rapidly, but because it's continuous, it's clean, uh, cleanses you uh, on a, uh, a regular basis such that your restriction is not as severe. Um, for IgA, what would be your um, m uh, drug choice to be used for that? IgA is a condition uh, for the um, um, uh, audience here is uh, of, of an overproduction of a molecule, molecule called IgA, which is a, um, uh, an immunoglobulin. Uh, typically, it's produced in response to infections such as uh, throat infection, intestinal infection, or urine infection. In some of these folks, the uh, uh, condition is, um, um, is an overproduction of it such that it's released into the circulation and it starts going to the kidneys, causing inflammation in the kidneys. There's uh, no particular medications that we know of to 
prevent that from happening. There are some studies to uh, try to prove that if um, uh, these patients are exposed to less infections, that the in, uh, condition is less, uh, um, uh, would, uh, would not progress as much. On the other hand, um, the, uh, there, there's nothing that shows that that makes a difference. Of course, the usual care of uh, taking uh, medications such, such as ACE inhibitors that we discussed seems to reduce progression as well because it basically reduces pressure, reduces um, uh, the, um, the stresses on the rest of the kidneys that's not damaged yet. The question is, would you use chemo on that? No, there, uh, uh, there is no, uh, un unless it's a very severe condition, IG nephropathy, where you have, you start having severe inflammation in the kidneys, typically we don't use chemotherapy. Is there any harmful effect of take more protein uh, for weight loss? Weight loss, like you take more protein for weight loss. Is there any um, harmful effect on kidneys? Yes, yes, sir. The question is: there any harmful effect of taking more protein? Um, for instance, in those who are engaging in, say, the Atkins diet, there's probably uh, there's there are theoretical studies in animals that uh, those who are fed high protein tend to have more protein loss and therefore more damage to the kidneys. On the other hand, uh, in, uh, in humans, the studies were done only on um, average protein intake versus low protein intake. There's no studies to show high protein intake. So the theory, in theory, there is a risk. And I probably would not recommend that in a kidney patient. How about the healthy person in your case? The normal healthy person? The question in a normal healthy person, it is okay. Probably so, but make sure your kidneys are okay. You knew I'd have to ask something. Uh, I was just wondering if you could address um, medications causing kidney problems, since this patient sitting over here had that problem. Certainly, there are medications that have been known to be nephrotoxic or causes kidney damage. And um, typically, those medications are used for a relatively short time. Or, uh, as I mentioned, those non-steroidals, if used for long enough of a time, can cause kidney scarring. It's difficult to um, um, pinpoint, of course, what a patient may have had without knowing the history, it, but uh, some medications are known to be nephrotoxic. Uh, 